Welcome to the Brand Theory Podcast, the podcast for helping you uncover your passion, realize your purpose, and take the aligned action. Together, we're going to prove the theory that when we live our lives on brand, the possibilities become limitless. I'm your host, Danielle Marchesi, branding expert and business coach. Let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of the Brand Theory Podcast. Super cool guest today, Isabel Leong, travel blogger, SEO coach, a digital digital nomad. She fits perfectly into the idea of the Brand Theory Podcast to bring you conversations of inspiration and value to provide you these tips and tricks and, again, inspiration to live your best on-brand life in business, in your personal life, wherever, live in alignment, true to yourself, so you can get to your goals sooner rather than later. Before we get into this amazing episode, I just want to share a quick brand tip with you. It's actually not, it's kind of like a heavy brand tip, but I just feel like somebody out there listening to this needs to know this. This is just kind of on my heart today. So I wanted to share with you that is okay to say no. It is okay to move on. If you are in business for a longer time, if you're in business even for six months and you're ready to shift, you're ready to move on, you're ready to offer new services, it is okay to tell your current clients, hey, after this contract, I'm actually going to be no longer offering these services. It is okay to hand them to an assistant. It is okay to hand them to another fellow business owner. It is also okay to just honor yourself, honor your shift and say, hey, this is no longer my path. I've so enjoyed our time together. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've learned so much from this relationship. I hope that we can still work in a different way together or you don't have to continue working with them. But I just want you to know that when you get to that point of you're ready to shift in your business, you're ready to offer something new, you're ready to offer something completely different, those, those moments are going to come what you start in business, you're not going to offer forever. It's going to look different, whether that's, again, you bring an assistant, you bring a team to be doing that work for you, but there's a high chance it's going to look very different than when you started. I am the perfect person to attest to this. My business looked extremely different from when I started, but one of the hardest things is, is to realize that that those changes that you want to make for your own path sometimes doesn't include the current clients that you love so much. So I just wanted to bring this up. If that is you, if you are going through that, if you're thinking about making that shift and that change, but you're worried about what's going to happen to them, you're always going to find a way to take care of them, whether that's on your own, whether that's again, your team or your assistants, or if it is the one type of client that you keep because you actually really do enjoy working with them, or you hand them to a fellow business owner or you just kind of have to say, this is where we part ways for now and figure out a way to work with them in the future, or you don't, it is okay. Whatever you are feeling, whatever feelings are coming up around that, it is okay. It is all going to be okay. You're going to figure it out. If that is something that you're going through and you want to chat about it, you know where to reach me inside my Instagram DMs is the best place to do that. I am, you can find me Danielle underscore Marquesi. That's M-A-R-C-H-E-S-E. It's also down in the show notes, but back to our conversation today. I know that was a little heavy. We have a really, really, really fun conversation with Isabel. She's a full-time travel blogger and SEO coach roaming the world at a whim. She draws energy from being outdoors. She's an explorer at heart and the world is her playground. She helps aspiring bloggers and brands get the most out of their online presence and financial freedom by making Google By ranking on Google faster with SEO and exposes millennial travelers to experiences beyond their imagination. I I can't even say much more other than she is like the true epitome of what you think of a travel blogger. She's a real person. She does her work. She has a team that works for her. She has been able to build this amazing business all while traveling, and she tells us exactly how she did it. So let's get into this episode. Welcome to the show, Isabel. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm super excited to connect. I did a little bit of a stalking of you (laughs) and definitely have a story to tell here. And that's exactly how I want to start this off. Just tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are today and how you fell into this amazing life of travel blogging. Yeah, so I actually started my travel blog when I was in school and university when I had this opportunity to do a semester abroad so I did that and I went to France it was my first ever trip out of 
Asia and doing it alone. So it was a big deal for me back then at 21 years old. And then I also had like my DSLR, my very first DSLR. So I really <laughs> went in very excited, full of um, anticipation for all the journeys and all the adventures that I was going to have. So that's how the blog was born because I wanted a place to document all of my travels and also a place to share my pictures. Back then, I don't think Instagram was there yet. Yeah, yeah probably so, not. <laughs> yeah, so the blog was that outlet for me. And then um, I was, I always treated it as a hobby blog, but like fast forward seven and a half years later, or rather like in 2018, I reached a stage where I was able to monetize my traffic because I was getting like the traffic that that um, was required to, you know, properly earn a decent income from there. So I've just been doing it full time since then. And I've been traveling the world full time as a digital nomad. And so you see me here now in Costa Rica. Yeah, I love that. I, you know, we connected today and I was like, so where are you in the world today? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, that's really cool. So how did you... I guess I, I just want to hear a little bit more about how you kind of started monetizing for yourself. We'll definitely give you guys some tips and tricks on that later, but I definitely want to hear about what was the first inkling of, of, Hey, I could maybe make this, make this my thing. I could maybe live off of this. Yeah. Um, for me in the beginning, it was kind of tough. I, I had, I had hopes, but very small hopes of monetizing because coming from Singapore coming from the Asian country my demographics originally started with Singapore like my friends and families right so I had originally very small hopes but then as I grew I started seeing like audiences from the UK audiences from the US and then I had a target of 25,000 views um, Mm -hmm. for my 25,000 views monthly for my blog because um, after some research I found that the best um, advertising dollars came from traffic from like the US or Canada or UK. And so that was when I started focusing on just um, attracting US traffic. So when you ask like where my income comes from, it comes from a variety of different sources as a blogger. Like I could, if you, if you scroll through my post, you'll see ads come up once in, once in a while and so that comes in the form of passive income when these advertisers they pay per thousand impressions and so okay. you don't necessarily have to click on it it's not per per click you don't you don't get paid per click so essentially it's like the more traffic you get the more people are reading your posts mm. the more income you get from this passive source of income and then um, when I have posts that appear on the first page of Google, when I attract a lot of traffic, for example, I have this best clubs in Amsterdam post. And then I would have uh, advertisers, like um, direct advertisers wanting to place a brand mention on that blog post because it's doing well. So for yeah. instance, I've had one advertiser that sells nightlife tickets who approached me to place their brand or their link onto my blog post, my clubs in Amsterdam blog post. Wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm starting to get an understanding of this now. Mm -hmm. So where, let's go back to the traveling a little bit. Where are some of your places, your favorite places that you've been? Yeah. I really enjoyed um, New Zealand because it's the first country I ever lived the longest Mm -hmm. for. I was actually doing a working holiday there for almost six months. And it was really fun because like, not only is it a vast contrast from Singapore which is a cosmopolitan city where you know it's always noisy and all that over there in New Zealand I was living in the countryside you know you wake up to bird calls and all that and the pace of life was also much slower people were so much warmer um, and you get to go on adventures like hiking or even like glacier even trekking on the glaciers so that was really cool that's so cool. How long yeah. do you stay typically in each location? Do you know how long you're going to stay when you go? So right now, ever since I've embarked on this digital nomad journey, I try to stay as long as I can um, in each country. So Mexico allows for six months long of a tourist visa, like 180 days of t- tourist okay. visa. And like most places, they only allow three months, um, 90 days. So Bolivia, I stayed for three months. Peru, I stayed for two and a half. Costa Rica, I'm planning to stay for 90 or so days. I love it. 
So when you say, you know what, I feel like going home. I feel like going home for mm-hmm. a week. Where's home for you? Ooh, that is tough. Um, home is essentially still always Singapore, which, yeah, I wouldn't be able to go there for one week because I'm so far away from Singapore now. And and that's not, yeah, I haven't been home in more than a year since I left during the pandemic. Yeah. But essentially, it will still be my home. Like, I've got my wardrobe there. My family's there. And the best food is there. <laughs> yeah. I love yeah. that. How did your family feel about you saying, yeah, I'm just going to go do my thing. I'm just going to go live my life. Digital nomad. They, I'm going to do it. They definitely, it wasn't, it wasn't something they were pleased with, for sure. Um, but uh, they also know that I can't stay still for long. And yeah. <laughs> I don't really like holding a... A, a standard job back in Singapore like I don't, I don't get happy or fulfilled doing it so sure. they've kind of resigned to me jet setting the world <laughs> and yeah. I mean if I'm able to hold up my own expenses draw a decent income they can't really say anything except that I yeah. mean they worry time to time you know when of you're course. in Mexico and your stuff gets stolen they think there's mafia going on oh no it's the did that actually happen to you your stuff got yeah, stolen it, it did yeah Oh my gosh. How long were you like, did you ever get it back? No, sadly not. I lost um, my phone, my laptop, my wallet. Yeah, basically all the valuables. And they had to send my cards from Singapore over to the next place where I was at. Oh that was my a major gosh. Headache. That does sound like a major headache. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm glad you powered through that and didn't deter yeah. you from, you know, living the lifestyle that, that yeah. is calling to you. Um, Mm -hmm. definitely can imagine that that was scary. Do you think you'll do this for the rest of your life? Or do you think one day you'll, you'll find a place you'll settle down? Yeah. I feel like part of my urge to travel and discover the rest of the world is also finding a place I can call home. Mm, I love that. So yeah. She's doing all the research for us guys. So we don't have to go do it. (laughs) Yeah. So I think, yeah, like a place where, where I feel a calling towards. So I don't think this will continue on all the time. Like there would be as much as I try to stay as long as in one place as possible. Like sometimes I do like spurts of travel where like one month I'll be in the Dominican Republic and jumping around places to discover as much of the island as possible. Um, and then I get super burnt out. I'll be like, oh, I just want mm. a place to dump my luggage and and rip open like just like lay out my clothes so that I don't have to pack, yeah. I don't have to dress from my luggage yeah do so you, it's nice to always have a home base yeah yeah definitely I can't stand living out of suitcase for one day mm-hmm. so I can, can't imagine always having to yeah. <laughs> so roll around even though I've I definitely have had that itch I definitely was you know there was a year, I guess, right before the pandemic where I was back to back travel and I loved it but I can I definitely was burnt out so I can't I give you so much kudos for doing this full time and showing us how amazing (laughs) your travels can be. Um, How do you find places to stay? Yeah, so um, it depends from place to place. I mean, the easy way out is Airbnb, of course. But when I try to stay a longer term, like a month or two months, I like to go direct to the to the owners and depending on where you are like for instance in Mexico um, Facebook groups are a big a big Mm -hmm. outlet for people to rent out their rooms so that was where I went to really get a good deal for like $300 I was able to get two bedrooms and the entire level was for me like private kitchen private bath and even two bedrooms which is more than I even need yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so Facebook groups, that's good to know. I, I don't think mm-hmm. I would have thought that. Airbnb yeah. would be my first my first bet. Mm-hmm. All right, let's move into talking a little bit about SEO. So how did you, I mean, you're a blogger, so that's kind of like a, a natural thing for you. First of all, where are you hosting your blog? Where have you hosted your blog? I have hosted in on site ground at the beginning. And then when my traffic took on another level, I shifted to lyrical hosting. Okay, so how did you start tapping into the power of SEO and Mm. what things did you kind of play with to help get Google ranked over and over again? In the beginning, it was really all random. I was just putting out articles based on my personal experience. I was talking about New Year's countdown in Paris, which who cares about it? Like who cares about your experience after a while? Like 
So, so yeah, it was really random in the beginning and some were very helpful articles and like the very, very first article that kind of became viral or like started attracting traffic on its own was an article on how to create an itinerary on Google Maps, which, which like on one hand, it's super helpful with that. Therefore, it makes sense that it goes up the Google's ranking. And then on the other hand, when I was studying my metrics, I, I found that people were searching for keywords such as that. And so as I delve deeper and deeper into the metrics and the statistics, I found that I've experimented with a lot of different ways. I was on Pinterest for a good long while. I also tried sharing on Facebook with my with my with my blog page. Um, yeah, and so with all these uh, methods, I've just found that the most efficient, time efficient way to grow your traffic is ultimately SEO because as part of the experimentation, when I put in a lot of effort to put put out a good blog post, it it ultimately ranks on Google based on like different factors, which we can go into in detail more later. But after I put out this really good blog post, I let it sit there on the blog. It tends to like, especially if it's seasonal, like I have a post on the best places to visit in Greece in October. Mm -hmm. And so without touching the article much at all over the years, it always gets traffic whenever summer approaches, like whenever October is approaching. Yeah it starts coming up on the first page of Google, first ranking of Google again. And then I get all these passive traffic without me even having to like rewrite or re-promote the post. Whereas for Pinterest, you have to pin like what, 20 times a day and design, yeah, and design the pins as well. And then, yeah, social media has not been the best way to drive traffic for me. And so that's how I found that SEO is the best way to go. And that's how I've really focused in on optimizing most of my posts including deleting the old posts about New Year's and count- New Year countdown in Paris where, you know, nobody was searching for it. Mm. Really just making my whole blog really lean and serving the audience. So how often do you feel you need to put out articles to, I guess, feed the SEO system? Yeah, I like to generally, as a rule of thumb, I like to say once a week. Okay. Yeah. And then what kinds of, like you say, keywords and you say, I guess, how do we make sure we're choosing the right keywords that are favorable? Yeah. So it all comes down to keyword research, which is trying to meet the demand of what people are searching for, but also keywords that are not too competitive, where already big authoritative sites are ranking for it, like Wikipedia or CNN or Forbes, these big media outlets that are already ranking for the, like if you were to search how to lose weight, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be overpowered by all the big authority sites. So part of the keyword research, you look at different, different factors, including like the competition and also how much, how many people are searching for that particular keyword per month. And then you typically, as a new site, you typically, typically want to target long tail keywords, which are keywords that are around four, four words long so that the competition is not that high. Like for example, how to lose weight is super competitive, but maybe how to lose, like how to lose weight on a vegan diet or something like that, you know, where okay. the, it becomes a subtopic. So yeah. then it's less competitive. Gotcha. How do you suggest us starting to try to find our own keywords? Is there a website we can go to? Are there systems in place for that? Yeah, of course, there are um, paid keywords and the most entry level keyword research tool that I recommend is keyword re no, it's key search. That is really great to start off with. Uh But um, even with Google search on its own, the Google search engine result page, the SERP, there are Chrome extensions you can download that will show you how many like the volume of people searching for that particular keyword that you keyed in. It also shows some key metrics of your competitors, those that are in the first page, what are their metrics, um, how long the the word length of each article. And also on just on search result pages, whenever you key in like a general keyword, like um, things to do in Greece, usually before you hit enter, you will see a drop down of 
the long tail keywords like there would be things to do in Greece at night things to do in Greece with ki- ah. kids that sort of thing so that's a good way to brainstorm long tail keywords based on that main topic that you want to write about yeah and then when we're posting an article where do these keywords need to be yeah so they need to be on the title mm-hmm. in the URL slot so if it's belaroundtheworld.com slash things to do in Greece so that's the URL slot and then Sprinkled throughout your sprinkled throughout your article as well in the headers, H2, H3 headings. Also in your images, when you upload images, there is the option for you to key in your to fill in your title, description, and alt text. So you want your keywords to also be there. Mm, okay. I feel like those are things I always forget to do. It's like, yeah, yeah, I found this good keyword. Let me throw it on my on my title, mm-hmm. whether it's an article or just a regular website page but I forget about all the depths that you need to plug it into yeah, if as it, well if it helps I have this on-page SEO checklist that um, I can pass you the link and every anyone's free to download it so yeah it's good I mean to have I would it. definitely use it <laughs> side so we'll side definitely menu. put that in the show, mm-hmm. na- show notes for you guys okay yeah. cool so is that using SEO is that kind of how you've been able to gain this traffic on autopilot so to speak on the most part yeah because I mean, I travel while working, so my time has to be super efficient. And that's just the best way I found to grow my traffic Mm -hmm. instead of rather than posting regularly on on social media, which like which on the other hand, you also have to grow. So with Google, with SEO, no no one's gonna discriminate you if you have zero followers or a million followers. Right. As long as you put out good content that serves people who are searching those keywords, it always shows up on Google search. Right. Do you have you found, I guess putting the majority of your marketing energy, let's say, into this SEO part of it, mm-hmm. has that taken the pressure off of you a little bit for social media or not really? Yeah, yeah, it has. Um, well, on one hand, social media followings, whenever you are doing brand collapse, they also look at your social media following for, right. for True. yeah, for whether the collab goes well or not. Um so it's always good to have a healthy portfolio of your social media profiles. But when it comes to really driving content and getting majority of my income, it's always just having that passive traffic that helps. Yeah. So I don't have okay. to worry about constantly hustling and looking for brand deals on my Instagram right. or Facebook or Twitter. Totally. Yeah. So let's talk now about, about brand mm-hmm. deals and collaborations. When did you start diving into that? I would say pretty early on 2015 if I started my blog in 2015 I think it was somewhere like one or two years later I I started really looking out for PR companies promoting travel travel news so like for instance oh um, this particular airline just released a flight route to the Maldives and then sometimes I would see if the flight route caters to my audience and then according peach accordingly or sometimes it's also like oh I'm traveling to the I'm traveling to a new country like New Zealand I'm going to start looking at brands or tour companies that I potentially would would um would pay for and in any case but I would also like reach out beforehand just to see if they would be willing to work with me to get their brand get their tours featured on my blog and my social media profiles and when you're approaching them, is there like a script that you follow? Do you do it through email? Do you do it through social media? Yes, I do it through email most, most, mostly. But these days, like these days, sometimes I do reach out through Instagram DM, for example. But for really big brand collaborations, I always go, it th- go through email. And mm-hmm. I do have a set of templates that I also have. So if you want, I can put it in. Yep. We'll throw them in. (laughs) Yeah. So I think, you know, starting a business today is so different than when you and I started. Um, And you and I have very different businesses, but it's, it's just so different. So I think giving people as many tools as possible for to allow them to pick their own paths. I just, I love it. So yes, give me everything that you want to want to spread out there for sure. Um, Cause I think it can be scary too with, I don't know how you feel, but I feel that brand collaborations has gotten a little bit of a bad rap over the years. And there's, it doesn't have to be like that. It could very be this co-collaborative creative 
entity that benefits all parties. Um, so, and it's, it's very clear that you have For done sure. it very successfully over the years. So I would <laughs> love to get your take on what are like some do's and don'ts with stuff like that. Yeah, sure. It's definitely a lot about wording and messaging as well and how the other party stands to gain from this collaboration. So it's not just about, oh, what do you want to get? What what kind of free stuff right. do you want to get? Which is why, yeah, messaging really helps. Okay, cool. So yeah, we'll definitely take you up on those templates mm-hmm. for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so is there anything else business-wise, like business tips for anybody who's maybe starting a blog or exploring SEO as a, as a job for themselves or you know, starting brand brand collaborations. Is there any other tips and things that you want to mention about that subject particularly? Yeah, I can say that learning SEO is, can be overwhelming. Like for me, I took like three years to really master it and turn it full time. And it can be done in a much shorter, in a much shorter time frame if you really know what to target. Like I used to, like I mentioned, like do a lot of experimentation, spending so much time on different social media that didn't work. So if you're serious about growing your blog and getting traffic and monetizing it, you already have that clear goal. Then you will know that SEO is really the way to go if you want long-term traffic and not have to pay for them. So it's a good idea to really just go in head on with SEO and then really optimize each and every post and take time for it. A lot of people, a lot of my students also like, oh, I don't have time to blog. I have to um, deal with all the other social media platforms. I don't know which to focus on. I don't have time to write. So I've done a ton of trainings to really help speed up writing and also really just help them to laser, like focus in on what really matters for depending on what stage they are at blogging. Yeah. Yeah. So would you recommend starting a blog for somebody like me? Like I blog maybe once a month, maybe every other month if I'm Mm -hmm. feeling good, I'm feeling into it. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend being consistent and and starting a blog for a service-based business? Yeah. So a lot of people start a blog for, to build up their authority, right? So I guess that could be something, that's something that you're trying to achieve. And the more content you put out there the more google kind of assesses your blog to see that okay if you are they they look at keyword density right if you're talking about a certain topic a lot the keyword density increases and so that's how you get recognized and that's how that's a consideration whenever they rank you for those certain keyword search terms so i would say i mean it's not going to be easy because the internet world is so saturated now, but yeah. you definitely have a stand a chance, especially if you are in a niche industry, you definitely stand a chance of ranking if you really put out authoritative articles out there. And not only is it good for SEO, but when it comes to sharing your portfolio to, to, to new people, when you are like, you know, sharing your portfolio and they come across your blog, your website, and they see how much content you've put out there, you've definitely earned the authoritative batch that, yeah. you know, that might increase your chances of working together if it's a brand that you're pitching to. So it's definitely yeah. always a good piece because you're building your authority in that space. Gotcha. Okay. Yes, I'll have to look into it a bit more. Yeah. Hold myself to a harder schedule. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely something that I've, I've wanted to do and I've always thought about turning podcasts into blogs or repurposing content. I have the best intentions. It's just about sticking to it, I think. And yeah, I think with you already have so much content with podcasting and speaking to different people, there's so much valuable and interesting content out there. It's super easy to just repackage it into text and then just dump it on the blog. At least the, the keywords are there. At least Google can crawl it. So even if you're not focusing on SEO, like in the long run, when you do decide that you want your articles to rank, at least you already have the content out there and right. it's not gone to waste. That's so true. That's so true. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I just have a few more curious questions about, about your <laughs> travels and whatnot. What, what would you say? I know it depends on the location, but what would you say your typical day is like? Like, I know you mentioned your students yeah. and I don't know if you work with clients in doing SEO, like tell us what, what that's like. Yeah, so a typical day varies every single day, but I'll give you a default day. So I wake up, I try to clear my emails. 
sometimes I have um, articles that are already written by my writers and then I would edit and put them up on the blog. Sometimes it's scheduling content on my social media platforms because right now I'm trying to push out a lot of content on my SEO work. Sometimes it's also like answering, um, getting on with client calls because I do have um, some SEO clients that okay. I do SEO work for. So that could be also one. Um, sometimes if I've just done with my with my travels, I have a ton of photos, then I would have to edit them. A, yeah, so it really varies. But for the most part, it's a lot of content, um, whether it's writing content, editing content, editing pictures, answering emails, because that's where most of like, that's where all the brand, um, that's where all the active advertisers are at when they are looking to right. advertise in my blog. So that's important. Um, and then it's pretty flexible. Like sometimes if I'm feeling good, I work through the whole afternoon to the evening. But if you say I feel lethargic, I'll go for a run in, in the evening or plan for my next trip. Yeah, you know, like um, during Holy Week, I was working throughout the week and then I felt like I deserve a break. So yeah. the week after, I decided to give myself a week off and travel around Monte Verde and the different beaches in Costa Rica. And this week, I just got back and catching up with work. So it's really flexible. I love that. I am mm-hmm. so for the taking the random weeks off. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that I can do that right now, but it's definitely a goal of mine. I want to take at least a week off every quarter, you know, mm-hmm. if not if not every month, More. but <laughs> that, that's awesome. How do you decide where you're going to go next? Oh, um, so I like whenever I am in a new country, I have maybe one month to three months of time in that country. And usually I like to spend like the first month working. And then when the second and the third month approaches, I'm like, oh crap, my time here is coming to an end. So I, I start like researching all the places that you have to go in that country and try to fit it in within my work travel schedule so yeah based on based on places that people really recommend I like to talk to locals a lot Mm. so they give me the best recommendations on places to go yeah what's like your first thing that you do when you go to a new location what's like your your routine Ooh. um Definitely getting groceries, like looking for places <laughs> to shop. I like to I like to look at local markets as well. So yeah, it's always interesting experience. Like a Mexico local market is gonna be different from a Bolivia local market. So that's fun. And then when like when I'm a bit settled in, I like to look at um so there is like I like to look at uh secondhand, like how do you call it? Like a garage mark, like a garage yeah, sale. Yeah, like a yeah, like a garage sale, secondhand market. Yep. Blue yeah, market. yeah, but it differs for every place like in San Jose in Costa Rica most shops are kind of just in malls but then when I was in Bolivia there is this they claim to be the biggest market in the world where they are just selling not just fresh produce but also secondhand stuff so it's always fun to you know poke your nose around and see yeah, what totally. they have it's very yeah. fun and this is you do this completely on your own or do you have any travel buddies? um yeah in the past year I was traveling with uh a guy that I met in Costa Rica before so that's been fun but I think moving forward I might have to after Costa Rica I would probably be traveling on my own so it's really a mix of like whether I see somebody that I really click well with or not then I'm also comfortable traveling independently I love it you Mm -hmm. go I love this Mm -hmm. so this is one question I ask all of my guests um we define the brand on term uh, on brand we define the term on brand here as making the conscious choice each and every day to live in alignment with who we are and what we what we truly desire in all areas of our life um was there ever a time it could be business related blog related or something completely different where you were living off brand and you weren't living in alignment to your your true self and how did you recognize that? And how did you navigate back to living on brand? Yeah, I feel like that past life before I started travel blogging and traveling was off, like totally off brand. And a lot of people live with that. Like for me, I graduated out of university. I knew I didn't have connections. I knew I had to get a job to have an income and sustain my expenses. So I got a full-time job. Um, and as much as I didn't really 
vibe with the whole office corporate culture I know it's something that everyone else does like you know if I look at my friends left and right everyone's in a in a yeah. corporate job in Singapore and so I tried to stick with it even with my even before that first job out of university I was in a an internship for six months in an agency in a PR agency I was miserable <laughs> so I told myself like when I did the internship I told myself I didn't want to work in an agency anymore but I mean I get that there are a lot of life obligations and responsibilities and so getting a full-time job is kind of obligatory and so I thought that I would be happier with the with the job that I got which is in a social media agency with a flat hierarchy but still like I just like something in me just didn't feel fulfilled like I was just doing things usually to please the boss and sure. to make sure you're not stepping on the wrong toes rather than innovating and doing yeah using using creativity to to achieve greater things it's usually very routine and yeah that's that's how I felt whereas now that I'm running my own business and running my blog and making my own schedules I feel so much more motivated I feel excited to get out of it every day because every day is a different day and because you're your own boss you are free to explore different opportunities like I thought I'll be blogging for the rest at least I thought I would just be blogging but now I am running SEO courses I yeah. am going into videos I'm learning how to you know video film myself while doing all these travel vlogs and so every day it can be if you choose to every day it can be a new challenge for you and it's been that way for me you know exploring new places it's always challenging my comfort zone and just challenging my personal personal development so it's really been uh it's quite been quite a journey yeah it sounds like it's been quite a journey well thank you so <laughs> much for sharing that with us I think you've inspired us all to go book a plane ticket somewhere <laughs> um but where can we find more about you where can we connect with you and follow along yeah. on the rest of your journey yeah sure so my blog is bell around the world so you can find it at bell around the world.com and you'll be able to find all my social media handles i'm pretty active on instagram like i share my insta story i share my day-to-day -day stories on insta stories Love it. and also my growing youtube where i'm sharing more and more of my central and south america adventures and then if you want to grab a copy of my free SEO training, you can also find it on my blog and then the menu buttons. Perfect. And we'll link that all below. Thank you so much again for, <clears throat> excuse me, coming on, sharing us about your journey and our SEO tips. I think you've left us with both inspiration and tactful information we can start implementing right away. So thank you so much. Thank you. We'll chat soon.